My day was officially ruined when the little boy with stars in his eyes shot my boyfriend point blank in the head. I remember my boyfriend's blood spraying the table, pieces of his skull stuck in my oatmeal like cat's teeth. It's weird. I remember our exact conversation and the song playing on the Amazon Alexa. Harvey was sidestepping to the beat and tapping his feet, really feeling the song. The smell of burned toast choked my nose, but I was too busy laughing at his corny dancing. I told him to open the window. Well, I didn't. Harvey was dead before I could open my mouth. I was looking directly at him when there was movement at the corner of my eye. I thought Jules had come in for more kitty food. It was my stupid fucking fault for mistaking a psychotic 10 year old boy for a long haired tabby. Harvey came over to me, coffee in one hand, toast in the other. He didn't see the kid. He didn't see the little boy point a gun at his head. Tiny index teasing the trigger. Harvey chose the wrong time to lean over the table, swiping oatmeal from my lips. Harvey's lips parted in a smirk as if he was going to say something like, you've got a little something there. But he didn't, because my boyfriend's brains were blown out before the words could leave his mouth. I was aware of his blood painting me, painting the table, painting the fucking breakfast I didn't even want. And yet my gaze still found the boy's eyes filled with impossible stars, insanity and mania entangled into innocent arrogance. I didn't know the boy's name. He was short, had tufty brown hair, and was wearing a Batman t-shirt. I already knew his eyes. I knew those stars, those impossible twinkling speckles of oblivion. At some point, I dropped my spoon, but I didn't hear it hit the ground. Reality was cruel, and this was mine. Harvey's body wasn't the first I had seen. I was used to being painted with blood, chunks of skull sticking to my hair. After all, it was my job, as a kid's presenter, to look after our town's psychopaths. I had seen my colleagues get their throats slit with unexpected weapons, strangled by tiny hands. The little boy took a step towards me, reaching into his pocket, slowly, like he was reveling in every second. I was used to no panic, no fear, only paralysis that held me to the spot as I waited to die. This time, I was sure I wouldn't be spared. I was 16 years old when my parents were murdered by two 8 year olds, Emily and Eli, the twins who lived next door. Starry Eyes Syndrome was a disease in our town that had twisted our younger generation into psychotic murderers. It started with an episode of a local TV show. Something inside the footage changed the kids watching, filling their eyes with stars. The effect wasn't immediate. Initially, they were isolated incidents. Kids were suddenly ripping into their stuffed animals. Then they were quietly killing their pets, hanging the collars like trophies. I was homesick from school one day, and my parents were downstairs eating dinner. Eli and Emily were like my own siblings. I had known them since they were babies, so it's common for them to walk into our house, usually with chicken pot pie. Emily was the loud one, and Eli tended to stay in the background, offering shy smiles if he had to. On the night they murdered my parents, I didn't even hear it. I woke with a burning fever and all I could hear was their hysterical giggles. Ruby, Eli shouted my name in a sing song. I forced myself out of bed, almost tumbling onto the floor. I was burning up bad. I had half a mind to dip my face in the cold, untouched soup mom made me earlier to cool me down. Eli was acting overly hyperactive, which meant mom had treated the twins to a sugar binge. Since their own mother was a health obsessed almond mom, my mother allowed them to have one candy bar a week. However, Eli and Emily were victims of what I called the sugar monster, who turned them into intolerable little brats. She wasn't the one babysitting them, so mom never saw the chaos, the trail of despair they left behind. I mistakenly gave them a Snickers bar and they destroyed my room. This time, I wasn't taking any chances. My room was a no Eli and Emily zone. I made it clear with the sign on my door, which they ignored, of course. Eli's voice was getting closer, the thud, thud, thud of his footsteps coming up the stairs. Ruby, come see, we've got a surprise for you. Slipping into my shoes, I managed a croaky laugh, pulling open the door. Mom, you can't give Eli sugar. I found 
found myself shouting into the pitch darkness. No response, only Emily giggling downstairs. Ruby, come downstairs. I could hear her jumping up and down on the one creaky stair she was obsessed with. The hallway light was off, which was odd. Mom reiterated that she had left it on so I could run to the bathroom if I needed to barf. I was half conscious and delirious when she said this, so maybe I misheard her. When I clicked it on, Eli was standing directly in front of me, a shadow lurking in the dark. Initially, I thought it was a reflection of the light. But looking closer, I was staring baffled at tiny twinkling stars in my neighbor's pupils. They didn't make sense to me, as if his pupils were filled with stardust, like he had been marked by a god. Taking a slow step back, something rancid crept up my throat. The boy was standing on his tiptoes, a grin stretched across his mouth. Maybe my fever was worse than I thought. Eli swung back and forth, his hands planted on the walls. He was definitely filled with sugar. There was something smeared on his shirt, lightly staining his palms. I blinked and found myself laughing, shaking my head of an eerie thought creeping into the back of my mind. Did you get ketchup everywhere? Eli, what have you been eating? He giggled. Maybe it was the dim light or my raging fever, but the boy wasn't blinking. I wasn't even sure he was looking at me, his gaze enveloped in oblivion. Something ice cold crept its way down my spine. I grabbed his face gently. Eli, look at me, I said. Hey, what's going on? Eli didn't react, his smile growing wider. It's blood. He pressed a finger to his lips. Eli was grinning dazedly at something over my shoulder. I thought Emily was hiding behind me. When I twisted around, there was nobody there. My neighbor bounced up and down. Do you want to see your surprise? I mocked a frown. Do I want to see your messy masterpiece? It depends. Did the sugar monster help you? Eli shook his head. Nope. We did it all by ourselves. I pretended to think about it. All right. You have my attention. He nodded eagerly. We made it just for you. Come see. Nodding, I swiped at my clammy forehead. Sure, but only if you promise to clean it up. You and Emmy, you're boring, he grumbled. Fine, I promise to clean up your parents' blood. My footsteps faltered, but he grabbed my arm, pulling me down the stairs. I didn't register his words until I stepped into my kitchen where eight-year-old Emily had peeled off my mother's face and glued it to her own. Mom was in pieces, chunks of her hanging from the wall. I walked directly into blood spilling across the tiles, the grisly remains of my parents tainting every surface. Dad's body was spread out across the table. They had severed his head and plucked out his organs, displaying them on the table like a game of operation. Emily spread out her hands, giggling. Ta-da, she said when my legs gave way and the ground swallowed me up. Do you like it? Their excited shrieks collapsed into white noise. I was aware of them dancing around me. Emily crawled over to me and forced my head up with the prick of her finger. She came so close to me, I could see the creases in my mother's flesh glued over her own face, the raw flaps of red sticking over her eyes. I didn't move, didn't scream, didn't cry. The world felt wrong, like I didn't belong to it. Time flowed slowly and I was no longer human, no longer capable of emotions. I just stared at the little girl wearing my mother's face and wondered if this was a product of my fever. I pinched myself once. Yes, of course it was. Twice. It was all a nightmare. A hallucination. Three times. I convinced myself, curling into a ball and stemming scarlet. My parents' blood warm on my skin, as if they were cradling me. Time moved slowly. Emily and Eli didn't stop there. They hacked at my father's body until he was nothing, until his blood ran in thick rivulets, pooling off of the edge of the table. I watched for a long time, letting it accumulate into a puddle of red. Emily was standing over me, a knife clutched in her fist, when her mother walked in and started screaming, her banshee wails clanging around in my skull reminding me that this was really happening. I didn't fully gain awareness until I was sitting in the sheriff's office, a cold glass of water grazing my lips. Instead of drinking it, I poured it over my head to cool down my fever. Ruby, can you hear me? The voice was familiar. Cold hands were lightly touching my shoulders, shaking me. Shock is a strange thing. It feels like you have stopped. Every part of you, body, mind, and soul, is stuck in a single moment. 
While the world continues on as normal, it wasn't until I was joined by others, several dozen of us, mostly teens and adults, covered in blood and unblinking, when I realized I wasn't the only one. We all had that exact same question on our lips. What the fuck had happened to the children? The answer, a local kids TV show from 2005. The name was never disclosed. Apparently, an episode was mistakenly aired. The police weren't specific about the episode's content, but it was said to have disturbing scenes of bodily horror. One of my high school classmates was the sheriff's son, and he told us that the content wasn't just disturbing. It was an attempt at brainwashing, twisting and contorting the minds of the town's children, turning them into psychos. The stars in their eyes were like a marking, whatever they had seen still alive, still sparkling in their pupils. I had questions because nothing about this added up. I googled kids shows that had caused violence in children, but I was just directed to the infamous Lavender Town Creepypasta. I didn't know the name of the show, so it was like searching for a needle in a haystack. If a disturbing local kids show had aired in 2005, why was it kept quiet? And furthermore, why wasn't it destroyed? Did the same thing happen back then? Why did it only affect the kids in my town years later? This thing had crawled into my neighbor's head. It was the direct influence of Eli killing my parents, so why didn't I believe it? Officially, it wasn't the children's fault. That's what the mayor said. He told the victims to choose forgiveness over anger, to remember the good times with our loved ones, instead of dwelling on their deaths. Yet I had found myself standing in my neighbor's yard, a carving knife in my hand. Eli and Emily had been taken away for tests, but in my dazed, muddled mind, I could still see my mother's face being used as a mask. Part of me wanted to hurt them, like they had hurt me. They took away my parents and laughed in my face. I wanted to scoop their fucking eyes out. The stars in their eyes were the mark of the devil, according to townspeople, but I just saw TV static, like the kids eyes were still broadcasting what they saw. In the time it took for me to heal from my parents' death, I finished my sophomore year of high school and moved in with my aunt. The kids affected were brought back into town, declared fixed. That was until the next day, when a three-year-old hacked her own mother's eyes out. Then a seven-year-old pushed her father down the stairs and cut off his legs to stick to her stuffed teddy bear. The town was in denial that our children's minds had been altered forever and there was no saving them. Years passed and these little kids got worse. They didn't just kill. These kids experimented on insects, animals, and humans. Four teenagers were found gutted in a child's attempt to turn humans into animals. Those kids were in my class. They were alive one day and dead the next. The sheriff reportedly barfed when he found the bodies. The police report said they were barely recognizable, only identified through their teeth and DNA. The sheriff's son gave us a far more detailed account, and I had to leave the classroom. Emily Adams, one of the victims, had her head stitched to the torso of a dog. Ben Chase had his organs removed, replaced with sewer water. Ryan Kane and Thomas Wesley were found in dismembered chunks of both animal and human. The perpetrators were seven and nine years old, and their argument was that they were playing. Somehow, it became the norm to hear of a brutal death, with the perpetrator being under the age of 12. It was clear that the kids needed a distraction, a way to lull their minds back to innocence that had been cruelly ripped away. A new kid's show was to be broadcast on a specific channel that would run all day and night. Following that, the mayor came out with a law. Graduating seniors were not allowed to go to college or leave town until the situation was resolved. We were technically kids too, and with their logic we could have been affected and asymptomatic. We argued that none of us had watched that show, but it was clear the officials behind closed doors were scared this thing was contagious. They were obsessed with keeping the outside world oblivious. Nobody outside our town knew about starry-eyed syndrome, and they wanted to keep it that way. According to the mayor, this was our problem. If we went to college and had this thing in our eyes without knowing, we were risking the lives of other children. So, the town law was, either get a 9 to 5, or become a kid's presenter. 
Presently, I wondered if the little fuck pointing his gun at my head recognized me from local TV. The boy inclined his head. Judging from the smile on his mouth, his index resting on the trigger, he did. The stars in his eyes dimmed slightly, and just like that, the boy lowered his weapon. I picked up my spoon and continued spooning oatmeal in my mouth. It was the only thing that felt normal, that felt real, at that moment. I lost my soul a long time ago, lying in my parents' blood. I lost my emotions too, though I think that was related to my job. You might not think a kid's presenter is considered a dangerous job, but in this town, it's practically a death sentence. The show was an attempt to fix the kids, a comedy involving a group of animals in suits. It was a test at first to see if anything would help these kids, and surprisingly, it had worked. I was Mrs. Bunny and had been since I was 18. I got the job pretty much on the spot because nobody else was stupid enough to pursue a job training mini serial killers to be children again. I hated my job. I auditioned because part of me wanted to forgive my parents' killers by helping the younger generation find their innocence. Two weeks in, I watched a six-year-old strangle Mr. Lion with a lighting cord. We were told these kids were reformed, that the littles on our show were harmless. Bullshit. The second I noticed stars twinkling in Olivia Ash's eyes, I tried to quit. But the studio wasn't stupid. They had successfully lured in freshly graduated seniors with a payment that would let us live comfortably. I guess they forget to mention that the second we signed our names, we were tied to these kids whether we liked it or not. One particular clause in my contract was that if we were injured or killed by a child, the studio was not responsible for our deaths, which was true. In a single month, three performers were dead and the rest of us were emotionless, mindless drones who wore animal costumes and prayed we weren't next. We were allowed therapy, but there's only a certain amount of trauma the human mind can take. Therapy and another fucking promotion wasn't the pat on the back. The town thought it was. Typical. I wanted to help kids who could not be helped, and my punishment for being a naive fucking idiot was doomed to my parents' fate. Being Mrs. Bunny had turned me into a shell of myself. I think I stopped seeing color, the world reduced to dull black and white, a fast-moving blur I no longer cared about. Food tasted the same, drinking never truly dulled my thoughts. I thought about smoking weed, to maybe try to get fired, but the punishment for a kid's presenter quitting was akin to a public execution. If we quit, the town would accuse us of abandoning their children. Mrs. Pebbles, the penguin made a huge deal of quitting and walking out, tearing up her contract. The rumor was that she had been taken away in a black van. I never saw her again. The town erased her name. That was what we got for running away, for abandoning a group of kids who could not be saved. They were too far gone. I knew that the second Eli appeared in front of me, the night he murdered my parents, I didn't even know they were dead, and yet those stars in his eyes reminded me of insanity, a vicious contortion twisting his mind into knots. This thing had torn away empathy, humanity as a whole. They were monsters that needed to be locked up or put down. These kids didn't need a kid's show to heal them. They needed a fucking white room. Try telling that to stubborn parents who insist they could be fixed and saved. While putting our lives on the line, I still felt like a kid. I lost my youth to trauma, and my adulthood was entertaining the monsters. Dealing with them every day, witnessing these preschoolers murder and injure, and attack innocent performers without any repercussions or consequences, I was losing my fucking mind. I didn't want to live in a town that was giving my parents killers a second chance, when they had shown zero remorse whatsoever. Eli and Emily, now 10 years old, had killed their mother, burying her body in the garden and digging her up like a dog. They insisted they were better, that the voices in their heads were gone. Their mother's biggest weakness was being a mother. She still wanted to believe her babies were innocent and capable of changing. Eli and Emily sliced her up and buried her six feet under. The authorities only found her body when a neighborhood dog was found chewing on a human arm. I thought the twins were going to face real consequences this time, but I saw them several days later, the two of them roaming the streets with baseball bats. The sheriff's son was right. 
Whatever those kids watched didn't just damage their minds, it rewired their thought process to believe killing was fun. If our mayor really thought he could save our younger generation with a kid's show, he was either stupid or delusional, or both. Our show wasn't saving them, it was their motivation to continue, throwing us to the slaughter. Here you go kids, don't kill your parents, but these guys are disposable. Harvey had been a proverbial light, one that would pull me out of the dark, leading me to a semblance of peace, and now I was covered in him. My oatmeal was crunchy, but I couldn't stop eating, stuffing myself and swallowing large bouts of barf when my stomach tried to reject it. It was part of my normal morning routine, and my therapist did say when I was feeling overwhelmed, I should return to my routine. There was blood splattered on the table and Harvey was dead, but my glass of orange juice was normal. The birds singing outside and the low hum of the refrigerator was what I knew. I grabbed my glass and took a long drink, reveling in the refreshing flush of orange quenching my scratchy throat. It tasted like poison, but I kept drinking until I couldn't breathe. Until orange juice was pooling on the table, my stomach entangled knots. The little boy surprised me with a laugh. He dropped his gun, reached into his pocket, and pulled out a small piece of card. You're funny, he said, dropping the card on the table in front of me, chewing half a mouthful of oatmeal mixed with barf. I leaned over. It was a brightly colored invite, my name printed on the top in rainbow colors. Ruby, you are invited to the Children's Society reunion. I swallowed thick oatmeal dribbling down my chin. Please, please, pretty please come and share memories with us. Love, the children's society. When I lifted my head to question the boy, a silver whistle was hanging from his mouth. Down, doggy, he said, eyes hardening. His words were still spiraling in my head when something slammed into me, a physical presence forcing me onto my knees, my hands pressed over my ears, a raw cry ripping from my throat. I was aware of warm red splattering from my nose. I could taste it on my lips, feel it slick on my hands, still stapled over my ears. Footsteps. The boy was hovering over me while I screamed for mercy, burying my head into the floor, my thoughts frenzied. I sensed him planting his foot on my back, forcing me onto my stomach. Bad dog. His voice floated around in my skull. Bad, bad, bad dog. Ruby. Blinking rapidly, I found myself no longer in my kitchen. Time had passed, and I wasn't even aware of it. I didn't remember calling the cops about Harvey or even getting in my car, but according to my phone, the cops were asking for a statement, and Harvey's mom was sending me capitalized death threats, like it was my fucking fault. I was at work, standing outside the girls' bathroom, my hands still pressed to my ears, a screech clawing in my throat. Mr. Snake, also Luke, was standing in front of me, his head inclined like a bad dog. The little boy's words felt like pinpricks in my skull. The last thing I remembered was being at his mercy, screaming gibberish, a monster splitting open my skull and stirring my brain into soup. So why was I still alive? How was I still alive? Ruby, you're scaring me. Luke's voice brought me back to reality. Mr. Snake was a favorite among the children, his soft-spoken voice a highlight of the show. He was the least likely of us to be viciously murdered. Freshly out of the makeup artist's grasp, already in his Mr. Snake costume, my colleague was frowning at me. The costumes got way too hot, so I wasn't surprised sweat was pouring down his face, gluing thick strands of dark hair to his forehead. His freckles were his best attribute. I couldn't tell if he was smiling or forcing himself to smile. Like all of us, Luke was a liar. He lied when he said he was okay, rejecting therapy. The guy may have had a voice for little kids, but it's not like he was here willingly. He hated his job as much as me. I was homesick a few months ago, and he'd witnessed the brutal murder of Mr. Bear who happened to be his best friend. Luke swiped at his forehead. Are you good, bro? I could never tell if he was being genuine. Yeah, I lied. I just felt sick. He curled his lip. Bullshit. He was right, but I wasn't going to admit that. I was sick. I repeated. I think I ate something. Luke didn't look convinced. Sure. He rolled his eyes. Have you seen Nima? Something ice cold slithered down my spine. Nina was the newest addition to the group of kids on our show. She was infamous as the nine-year-old who had a rapidly climbing attack streak over the years. Luke was terrified of her. No, I managed to get out. 
Is she not with her others? My colleague ran his hands through his hair, a nervous habit. He reached into his costume and pulled out a pack of cigarettes. Well, where the fuck is she? Instead of responding, I followed him back to set where performers were situated on stage for the intro song. The set itself was bright and colorful in a desperate attempt to remind kids not to kill, but blood had been spilled far too many times for me to think of it as innocent. The bright yellow floor had been replaced six times. Luke slumped into his chair, head in his hands. He was already in panic mode. We're so fucked, we're so fucked, we're so fucked. They were already playing the intro song, crew members ushering key performers on stage. I hated the intro. I could never get the choreography right, and I still had PTSD from finally perfecting it. Tipping my head back to find our newest cameraman's head taped to the ceiling. The crew had been looking for him all day. He lasted two days. Two days, and his severed head was already their toy. There were 11 children running around screaming, and not one person was trying to stop them or quieten them down. Elena, fully in costume, was being shoved around by two boys. When she raised her fluffy dog paw, the mayor who was on standby sent her a death glare. No matter what the kids did to us, we could not raise our hand to them, only scold them. I think Elena was too scared to speak. Per Luke's words, Nima was nowhere to be seen. She was supposed to be with the other kids at the end of their line, which could only be bad. I'm not looking for her, Luke mumbled into his knees. That psycho brat will gut me. Leaning against the wall, my mind was already spinning. But you're their favorite, I said, a sour edge to my tone. Why would they kill Mr. Snake? Luke lifted his head, his eyes puffy. I didn't blame him for crying. The last performer who went looking for a lost kid ended up as set decor we didn't find until we could smell him. Luke was terrified, his expression twisting, pleading with me. His gaze found Mr. Panda standing with his arms folded. Unlike the rest of the performers, Panda wasn't wearing his head, dark eyes glued to the kids. A makeup artist had attempted to tame his sandy hair, only for him to politely tell her to fuck off. What about Freddy? Luke whispered. I followed his gaze. Are you serious? What? Freddy won't mind looking for her. Yeah, because he wants to fucking kill her. Like me, Mr. Panda, also Freddy, was also a victim. Nima butchered his parents and little sister right in front of him. On his first day, he revealed it so casually, as if he was discussing the weather. We were eating lunch, and Luke almost choked on his sandwich. In normal circumstances, Freddy would be a risk to the kids and immediately fired. However, Normal had crashed and burned a long time ago. Our town was well aware that there were no replacements for fan favorite, Mr. Panda, so he was monitored instead. Freddy had a hollowness in his eyes that scared me. It's not like he didn't talk to us. He was friendly and cracked jokes, but sometimes he would just turn. Freddy smiled a lot, almost like he was trying to embody Mr. Panda. All of his smiles were fake. He too was a liar. His mood could go from 0 to 100 in a matter of seconds. When we went out as a group, he would be fine, and then he would be describing his parents' deaths in vivid detail like he could never escape it, reliving it over and over again, eyes manic, almost unseeing. The last time we went bowling, Freddy talked about starry-eyed syndrome all night, so much so that Luke told him to shut up. You would think there would be a protocol for this kind of thing, since there were murderous children everywhere, and victims of said children were definitely not mentally stable. Nope. It was in our agreements that the performer's responsibility was making sure every child was on stage. What's going on? Freddy came over, reading through his lines. I could tell he knew Nima was missing, and by the slightly manic look in his eye, Freddy only saw an opportunity. Nothing, I said, before Luke could open his mouth. I shoved him before he could. That Nima girl, Freddy's voice was trance-like, a smile pricking on his lips. Are you looking for her? Luke shot me a look. Both of us knew the consequences if Freddy successfully avenged his parents. I had no idea if the dragged away and thrown in a van rumor was true, but I wasn't planning on testing it. Over the years, I had developed the ability to read my colleague's mind from the look on his face. In his case, Luke looked nauseous, which was definitely telling me to keep my mouth shut. Nope. 
Relax, Guts, it's another kid, he said coolly, maintaining a smile. But Ruby's going to look for her. My colleague shot me a grin with way too many teeth. Anything to save himself. Right, Ruby. I was trapped under his smile, well aware of the others staring at me. Freddy was considered a danger to the kids, and Luke was being a stubborn bastard. Elena was too scared, and I could see Robbie intentionally hiding behind a tree prop, like he could read my mind. The others were being ushered to the stage, and for a moment, I was paralyzed. I didn't want to go either. I hadn't felt true panic for a long time, even at the mercy of the boy who killed my boyfriend. The feeling of my chest tightening, my breath thinning, was almost relieving. Ever since becoming a kid's presenter, I wondered if I had lost the ability to feel human. When Harvey was shot in the head, I continued to eat my oatmeal. I was covered in his blood, warm red slick on my cheeks and glued to my hair. I didn't feel anything. I felt numb. When the boy pointed his gun at my head, I waited for my body to react. But I didn't. Like my mother and father and Harvey, my body was just a sack of useless flesh. This time, however, was different. I was actually panicking, choking on my breath. The air felt thick, too hot, and yet I was shivering. I didn't want to try and find the girl awaiting a victim. I didn't want to fucking die. Unfortunately, it was survival of the selfish. I didn't have a fucking choice. Sure, I deadpanned. I'd love to go. I turned my attention back to Luke. Mrs. Bunny is at the back, anyway, so they won't notice I'm gone. I'll be back in five hours, probably missing my head. Luke grinned. He was either oblivious or pretending not to notice my sarcasm. That's the spirit. He patted me on the back with his oversized hands. Luke grabbed his head and screwed it back on, holding his paw up for a high five. I'll cover for you. I ignored his pathetic attempt at sympathy. Thanks. Luke knew I was shaking. He knew I was struggling to breathe, but he also wanted to stay alive. I couldn't blame him for that. With a two-fingered salute and a guilty smile I couldn't see, he grabbed Freddy, dragging Panda Boy away before I could lose all my composure and volunteer the selfish snake as tribute. The studio was a labyrinth I was yet to explore. I only knew the ground floor, where the local TV channels were made. I found Nima in the broadcasting room, on the second floor. The little girl was standing very still, her eyes lit up in eerie blue light. Stars reflecting from the screen in front of her. There was a body hanging from the ceiling, one of our cameramen strung up by his legs. I caught a flash of silver in her hand, a knife clenched between small fingers. Nima had carved off his mouth mouth, gaping flaps of scarlet revealing skeletal teeth. I forced a smile, just like I was told to do, but I was standing in his blood. His name was AJ. He was 17 years old. I took another step, biting down on my tongue. Nima, I said softly, Sweetie, what are you doing? Nima didn't turn around, her starry-eyed gaze glued to the screen. Watching TV, I turned my attention to the screen. It was an old broadcast, way before our show started. Looking closer though, the broadcast was on air. The TV show was vibrant red, streaks of color bleeding through. There were four little kids waving at the camera, their smiles wide. There was something looming over them. I didn't know what it was until the camera panned upwards, revealing a body hanging upside down. It was a man, his eyes wide, terrified. There were two girls and two boys. One girl, a ponytailed brunette jumped forward with a giggle, who wants to learn about the human body. Me, a brunette boy with freckles followed suit. I took a shaky step closer, my stomach twisting. I recognized those same stars, sparkling static that was so much brighter than any I had seen. In the boy's hand was a kitchen knife. He held it up with a giggle. Safety first. His voice was mocking, the other three mimicking him. I knew what was next. I had seen it, almost like a copycat. Eli stringing my mother up and gutting her. I didn't move when the boy plunged the knife through the man's stomach, dragging the blade straight down. The second boy jumped up and down. Now, to name all of the organs. He reached into the gaping cavernous flaps of flesh, pulling out stringy intestines. What are these called? Nima held up her own knife. Intestines. I didn't realize the kid's voices were in my head too, until I caught myself mimicking them. Intestines. I breathed. I could guess their next words, already choking on them. Very good. The kids laughed, their gazes following mine, like they could hear me. Very good. Ponytail praised. She took the blade from the boy and thrust it into the man's head. 
When Slithering Red followed, a fountain of blood splashing their faces, they laughed, and the footage faltered for a moment. Through three bright colors flashing on the screen, I heard the unmistakable sound of children's laughter. It felt almost close, my skin prickling, like they were right behind me, red, blue, green. I couldn't move, suddenly, couldn't blink. I found myself entranced, frozen. The picture fixed itself, the freckled boy inches from the camera. His starry eyes were more akin to static, like something was alive, drowning his pupils. Who wants to learn about the human brain? I do, Nima said, waving her knife excitedly. It wasn't the man's brutal death that twisted the minds of a whole generation of children which held me in a trance, bugs filling my mouth, skittering across my skin, panic. I was suffocating in it, drowning in a feral fear I thought I had lost. I didn't watch the man brutally skinned and opened up for education. I didn't watch the very first kids with starry eyes paint themselves in his blood. Instead, my gaze was glued to the little girl who had my mother's eyes, dark blonde hair tied into pigtails, who waved her scarlet hands, giggling with the others, the four of them ripping into glistening red with slimy fingers. She shrieked with laughter, her unblinking eyes filled, polluted, with static. When the girl's gaze met the camera, my legs gave way. I could move again, released from whatever held me in an iron grip. When I hit the ground, I was aware my hands were wet, slick with blood, but I couldn't move. The room was too small, the walls closing in. The little girl on screen was me. Oh. Luke's voice came from behind me, his breath on my neck. His gaze was stuck to the screen, and just like the little boy on the show, Luke's eyes were filled with stars. He inclined his head, mimicking his younger self, lips splitting into a grin. Weren't we cute? His eyes found the screen like he worshipped those stars. I opened my mouth to respond when Nima let out a cry. Luke's body jolted, his eyes rolling back before he seemed to get a hold of himself. My colleague blinked, the stars going out. Ruby. Luke shook his head, confusion clouding his expression. I could have sworn there was static in his voice like those stars were creeping down his throat. What are you? He shook his head, doing in here. Luke's dazed gaze found Nima, and then the dead cameraman hanging above us. He staggered back, planting a hand over his mouth. Oh, fuck, what did she do? He whisper shrieked. Is that AJ? Luke approached Nima slowly, talking to her in hushed murmurs, but the girl was still smiling widely at the blue screen, which was still on air, I thought dizzily. If that thing was still on air, then kids were still locally watching it. Ruby. Luke was hissing my name but I was taking slow steps toward a pile of DVDs. The top one caught my eye. Elena, TCS Audition. Luke, TCS Audition. I flipped through them, my hands trembling, until I landed on my name. Ruby, TCS Audition. Bad dog. Nima's sudden shriek rattled my skull, and I impulsively slammed my hands over my ears. When I twisted around, stuffing the DVD down my shirt, the little girl was pointing at Luke. There was something in her hand. The whistle, I thought. The exact same whistle the kid had earlier. Luke held his hands up, his cheeks paling. He shot me glare. What the fuck did she do? I couldn't move my lips. Nima. Luke spoke softly, though his voice was shaking. We just want you to come back with us, alright? The little girl shook her head. Bad dog. I was barely aware of Nima sticking the whistle in her mouth. Luke dropped to the floor, a raw screech escaping his mouth. Whatever this thing was, his reaction was worse, turning him into an animal begging for death. His body jerking violently, hands slammed over his ears. When the girl blew the whistle again, he stopped moving, whimpering into his knees. Nima stepped on his hand, and he let out a shriek. Bad dog. Luke stayed still, curled into himself. The third time she blew the whistle, I did hear it. I was suddenly bleeding from my nose, toppling onto my stomach. The sound didn't hit me until the pain did, electroshocks running through my skull. I could hear it, a static screech getting closer, a sentient parasite creeping into the meat of my brain. Luke's cries sounded feral, almost animalistic like he was close to jumping up and wrapping his hands around her neck. I felt it too. It was like a primal urge to attack my attacker. Nima loomed over me, a shadow with sparkling eyes. She stamped on my head, my nose bursting on impact. Her voice rang in my head, drowning Luke's screams into a dull murmur. Play dead. Just like that morning, my body entered autopilot. 
I wasn't aware of myself until I was sitting on my living room couch, staring at my television screen filled with stars. No, static. The invite was in front of me, crumpled and stained with old red. Ruby, please, please, pretty please come and share memories with us. From the Children's Society, the DVD with my name on is right here in my hand. There's a single piece of footage. Me at six or seven years old, chasing after a white rabbit which lured me from my parents' yard. The movie stopped when a stranger's arms dragged me into a van. Fuck. I haven't been saving these kids. Eli and Emily, Nima, they murdered my family and my boyfriend. And all these years I've blamed them. Whatever they are, whatever starry-eyed syndrome is, I think my younger self made these kids. Please help me. Tell me I didn't do this. Thank you to my super fans, Sweet Black Swan, Tacy, and Brooklyn. I really appreciate you supporting my channel, and I look forward to making more content for everyone.